Hello there, brave adventurers. We are making our way through the perilous landscape of the Abyss, looking over the denizens of corruption and chaos. At this point, we're entering into mid C tier, and things are definitely getting interesting. As mentioned before, devils and demons endlessly fight one another in the Blood War. In one such clash, the archdevil Glacia fought the demon lord Grast in a legendary duel. Glazio wounded Grast with her sword, and when his blood hit the ground, demons sprang up, thus spawning the first Babas, and also infusing them with a tiny bit of a devil's cleverness. A Baba has black or dark gray skin that weeps slime, has a gaunt frame, and a single horn that curves forward from the back of its skull. In combat, it attacks with claws or sometimes a spear, and it has a supernatural gaze that weakens its foes. Beyond this, it has some great spells, and it can use them at will. Darkness, Dispel Magic, Fear, Heat Metal, Levitate. The potential here really is great, and overall the Baba's strong suit is definitely its mechanics attribute. D&D is sometimes a rock-paper-scissors type of game, in which there is always a response to every strategy out there, and a Baba packs a lot of that into one CR4 monsters. This also makes a great sidekick for stronger fiends, and at high level play, it's quite feasible to have a couple of Babas accompanying a greater demon. The Nabasu is a monster that you might overlook or even underestimate. I think part of it comes from the creature's appearance. It's a medium-sized, fairly typical-looking demon. But this creature is actually CR 15, and it travels the plains devouring souls. The somewhat unremarkable appearance is likely part of the Nabasu's plan, as they often pose as lesser demons in an effort to get summoned by spellcasters into the material plane. I do find it odd that the Nabasu does not have proficiency with deception though. I personally would give it expertise, it seems so fitting. This monster is an outcast amongst demons, which really is saying a lot. If the most vile group of creatures in all of existence shuns you, You've got to be twisted beyond imagination. Well, this hate is drawn from the fact that the Nabasus devour souls. Any souls, even those of demons, even those of fellow Nabasus. The soul devouring carries over into the monster's actual stat block. This takes 10 minutes of feasting upon a slain creature, after which the Nabasu grows in power, gaining additional hit dice and increasing its attack damage and the stronger the soul, the better. These benefits do not last, however, and so the Nabasu hungers on and on for this spirit feast, same way that we mortals hunger for food. In combat, a Nabasu attacks with plain old claws and bites, and it has a soul-stealing gaze, which is somewhat powerful, though it's nowhere near as devastating as the name suggests. This is actually a pet peeve of mine, when some ability or a spell is made to seem so earth-shattering, but actually it has a very limited effect. It gets annoying when you see things like, Spell, Tomb of the Lich God. You target a creature within 60 feet, which must succeed on a charisma saving throw, or be banished into a secret prison created by Vecna, the god of dark magic. But at the end of each turn, the target can reattempt the saving throw and return right back unharmed. Yeah, you know, because a magical prison created by Vecna can only hold someone for like 6 to 12 seconds. Along with the slight nitpick, I can't help but notice again the odd stats. This monster is CR 15, but according to the Dungeon Master's Guide, its AC and hit points are that of a CR 12, and its offensive capabilities are that of a CR 11. Whoever designed that monster creation section really did not do a good job of explaining the actual process used in making the official 5th edition monsters. So overall, the Nabasu is a pretty cool high level demon that operates as a rogue infiltrator and has the potential to power up greatly due to consuming souls. My favorite part is its penchant for appearing as a low level demon, only then to later turn the tables with a hardcore twist. I've always been interested in water monsters, particularly because I love rivers, oceans, lakes, etc., and partly because water is a unique environment full of currents and mysterious depths and three-dimensional movement, and there are risks involved with swimming and potentially even drowning. 
The Wastrelith is an aquatic demon that brings corruption to bodies of water, turning them poisonous and both toxic to the body as well as the very essence of all who come into contact with it. The presence of a Wastrelith taints the water with this malign influence of the abyss, and creatures with enough exposure to it can fall victim to abyssal corruption, a vile situation in which the subject gains a new trait such as treachery, bloodlust, mad ambition, or demonic possession. The Wastrelith's combat abilities are really cool, and best of all, they have synergy with each other. It launches the grasping spout of acidic liquid that then pulls the target up to 60 feet into water. Then the water itself is poisonous due to the Wastrelith, and it has the ability to make water within 60 feet function as difficult terrain for those who are swimming there. And it can multi-attack with bite and claws uh, along with that grasping spout ability. So it's a wickedly awesome combination that all goes together. The Wastrelith absolutely deserves its high rating in mechanics. You could argue that maybe it should be a bit higher on this ranking, but whether you think it's overall C tier or B tier, still it's a monster that's worth checking out. The Nalfeshni. This is a monster that I've always been on the fence about. Partly it's the appearance. Is it savage and frightening? Or is it goofy and cartoony with those undersized wings? I think I'm going to give it a 3 in style. I think that's generous. Though remember that style does extend to more than just pure monster art. It's also the monster's overall tone and demeanor. And I will admit, there's a certain creepy factor with the Nelfeshni, as it's a grotesque mix of bestial traits. It's big and brutally powerful, yet deceptively intelligent and a warped version of nobility, dining on human flesh in a stained and rusted feasting hall. So while it might come off a bit cartoonish, I think of it as an old, old cartoon that would have terrified me as a child. A slight reskin that I would do personally is instead of its wings being too small, they're actually like angel wings partially ripped apart. As I mentioned, this demon is actually very smart, and it has a forceful personality to boot. They command lesser demons and tend to get things their way due to force of power and intimidation. It also has an intelligence score of 19, which, interestingly, so does the Wastrelith. Yet their descriptions make the Nalfeshni seem more intelligent and the Wastrelith simpler. I'm not sure why the discrepancy there. The monsters often get small spaces in the book for their lore, very small, and we see here the difference that just a few sentences can make. In battle, the Nalfeshni unleashes a horror nimbus, which combines a fear effect and a light effect. That's a bit unique, and it was given a very technical description in the stat block, but I'm thinking of it as one of those freak-out scenes in a horror movie that has flashing lights and disturbing images. In addition to these terror strobe effects, the Nalfeshni bites and double claws. All of that happens with just one action. It can also teleport up to 120 feet as an action. These mechanics are good, though I want a little more, such as spell casting. It had this in 3.5 edition. Call lightning, feeble mind, dispel magic, slow, and others. The lower intelligence, Barl Gura, much lower, and the lower intelligence, Yakul, have spellcasting. So why doesn't the Nalfeshni anymore? It has all of that intelligence for what exactly? The Nalfeshni is a perfect representative of a monster that is great if you add a little to it and you act it out just right. Otherwise, it's going to come off a bit wacky and a bit lacking. The Quasit is obviously the demonic analog to the imp on the devil side of things. But while the imp is one of the best, arguably the best devil overall, the Quasit doesn't quite live up to that high bar. The imp is bursting full of personality and clever tricks and has the potential for all sorts of role playing and storytelling. But the Quasit's much simpler. It essentially just taunts and prods others into acts of evil. The imp is really stylish with his red skin, his bat wings, and the scorpion stinger. The Quasit now has lost his wings, so, hmm, it's not a bad style, but it's just nothing special either. 
Speaking of no longer having wings, I wonder why that change was made. Maybe just to differentiate it from the imp? Seems a poor reason, because the Quasit can simply turn into a bat in order to fly. Also, the Quasit is not very smart with only an intelligence of 7, so I can't imagine it really making any plans. In terms of abilities, the Quasit can also shapeshift into a centipede or a toad. It has a poisonous melee attack, once per day it can emanate a fear aura, and it can turn invisible at will. So these are some nice mechanics, but the Quasit's real strong point comes with its ability to be an arcane familiar. When a monster crosses that threshold from the domain of monsters only into the territory of player characters, it takes on a whole new life force. It will get a name and have stories and become part of the central action that develops over adventure after adventure. So while the Quasit is sort of a worse imp, it still has a ton of potential to become a great part of your game. The dwarves tunneled down too deep and awoke something terrible and foul. A massive demon of the ancient world, and now it comes, wreathed in flame, with its whip and sword, to destroy all who stand in its path. Fly, you fools! At the very top of C tier, we have the Baylor, which obviously is the Balrog from Lord of the Rings. It has some great abilities, and an epic and devastating style that's virtually unmatched amongst demon kind. And, um, well, it doesn't have much else other than that. Whereas Tolkien took the time and pages to craft deep lore and all manner of connections and plots, D&D unfortunately does not deliver much in this area. I'm reminded of the Pit Fiend from the Devil Ranking, which is the highest CR devil in the Monster Manual. And it also has very basic and vague lore and not much else to interact with beyond the stat block. Baylor, as you would imagine, functions as a sort of demon general commanding hordes of other fiends in the endless onslaught of the Blood War or other hatred-fueled campaigns of its own design. The Baylor is rage incarnate, and few others can withstand it. Only a couple other demons possess its high level of sheer power, so above these mighty few we only have the demon lords themselves. The favored weapons of a Baylor are a flaming whip that can pull targets and a lightning sword with a devastating critical hit. It also exudes a fiery aura, and should it be defeated, it erupts in a terrible explosion. Beyond these offensive capabilities, it can fly and, as an action, teleport up to 120 feet. These mechanics are pretty great, though a score of 4 is really as generous as I can be, as I do think the Baylor should do more damage. It's CR 19. I'm actually surprised that this monster does not have legendary actions and legendary resistance. If the Baylor gets locked down by the characters, all of its epic might is going to seem a lot less epic. The Baylor is the perfect spokesmodel for demons in 5th edition D&D. It's iconic, rage-fueled, malevolent, but lacking in depth and could have used one more round of development. We've now witnessed the demons of C-tier, and like all mid-tier monsters, they encompass a mix of good and not-so-good aspects. Now, perhaps some of these monsters are favorites of yours. That's totally fine. You should keep on using them, keep on enjoying them. In fact, I hope my ranking videos help you to find ways to make them even better and enjoy them even more. Ah, the rancid smell of high tier demons. The corruption deepens, the treachery grows viler, and we descend further into the bowels of the D&D world beholding some of the nastiest and most interesting of demon kind. These specimens break new grounds of possibilities, and I award them for that. You are in attendance at the Baron's Feast. Across the room, you spot lovely Lady Jasmina, who has inflamed your heart with passion since you first saw her. You converse with her, merrily, flirtatiously, hoping to have a moment alone at some point. My, she is rambunctious. More than ever so tonight. Perhaps she's drank more wine than usual. The night goes on, and Lady Jasmina gets wilder and wilder. She cackles like a fiend. She throws her buttered fish into the face of other nobles. She rips the bodice off of another lady. You corner her, and her eyes are rolling back and forth. What has come over you? You shake her, then notice parts of her skin are sloughing off. 
<laughs> that was no human laugh. You grab her by the hair, but it rips off, along with half the skin of her face, revealing a wretched ghoul demon beneath. This horrifying fiend is known as the Maurezi. It is a spawn of Dorsane, the king of ghouls, who is a demon lord in league with Orcus, the demon lord of undeath. Dorsane created the first Maurezis by transforming an elven city, and this twisted corruption of nobility carries through until today. On that note, there is something of a mysterious and convoluted history between ghouls and elves in D&D. If you look at a standard ghoul's claw attack, you'll notice that it cannot paralyze elves. Why is that? Some claim that D&D creator Gary Gygax stated that elves are too aligned with positive energy to be affected by essentially a negative energy creature. Others state that it comes from Tolkien, in which a ghoul's paralysis comes from the target being overwhelmed by the fear of death, but elves being immortal did not experience such fear. Others still cite Chainmail, the old school miniatures game upon which original D&D is largely based. In Chainmail, elves were immune to ghoul paralysis, probably as just a balancing mechanic, because ghouls were cheap units and elves were expensive units. This rabbit hole goes even deeper if you want to follow it, but what we do know from the 5th edition lore is that the Marezi is an abyssal fiend that's part undead, part demon, and its kind was made from transformed elves. A Marezi has some interesting abilities. Its bite damages the charisma score of the target, and if said target falls to zero charisma, it dies and later rises as a ghoul. Its claw attack inflicts paralysis, even against elves. It can revive slain ghouls and ghasts. And, best of all, the Marezi can assume the form of any humanoid it has eaten. It has proficiency with deception to go along with this, thankfully. The demon then infiltrates society in the guise of the person it devoured, spreading corruption and contagion, creating ghoul minions in secret. Its ruse cannot last, though. It's a demon, after all. Its wild and bloodthirsty nature are too much for long game, and the false appearance of the humanoid rots away after only a few days. Gods, what a cool monster. It has unique and powerful abilities, a freaky style, and sows madness beneath the surface of society before its own plans then horrifically collapse and it either breaks into carnage or just moves on to its next target. Whew, nasty stuff. The Dregoloth is another demon plus something else kind of monster. In this case, it represents a fiendish drow offspring. Volo's Guide to Monsters says a Dregoloth is a half drow, half glabrezu demon born of a drow priestess in an unholy, dangerous ritual. So in other words, this has its way with this. And if the dark elf doesn't get killed by demon sex or by other foul components involved in the ritual, or by demon spawn growing in her womb, or by giving birth to a baby that's probably far too big for her to handle, then we end up with a Dregoloth. According to the lore, the process fails more than it succeeds. But drow are depraved, and a twisted people, and they clamor incessantly to gain the favor of Loth, queen of the demon web pits. In fact, successfully birthing and obtaining a Dregoloth is considered a blessing from Lolth herself. This demon is a powerful thing, a foul combination of the stealth and prowess of a drow and the strength of a demon. It even has two pairs of arms to represent this. It has a large, powerful pair and a drow-sized, dexterous pair. The creature has powerful melee attacks and the same innate spells of a drow. Dregloths, per their demonic blood, crave slaughter and thus they are trained as assassins and slayers and wielded against rival drow houses and whatever other enemies. Really cool monster overall. So, speaking of the Glabrezu, here he is. Unlike what happened with the Hezro, Goristro, and Nalfeshni, the Glabrezu has translated over well from 3.5 edition. It is a big and highly intelligent demon that attacks with both pincer claws and pummeling fists, as well as magic, the likes of confusion and power word stun, along with a few utility spells. It strikes a good mechanical balance, complex but not complicated. 
It has enough going on to take different angles and different approaches, and it's not going to get boring fast. Another interesting and unique point with the Glabrezu is how it's not a big dumb brute. Aye, thank ye for that! Its preferred style is that of a corrupter and tempter. It speaks with the mortals. It tries to entice them, to bargain with them, to trick them. Why just come screaming into banal combat right out of the gates when you can sow the seeds of corruption and spread your wickedness to a much wider scope than merely the immediate combat encounter? Of course, the Glabrezu is a demon, so it has no intention of fulfilling promises or keeping packs. It seeks to outwit and exploit those with weak wills, and then, if the opportunity is right, it will slake its bloodlust in fierce battle. Brute monsters and basic beasts do have their place, yes, but it's so nice to have monsters like the Glabrezu that can really make a difference, interacting with the story and doing things that we're going to go on to actually remember. Another iconic demon of D&D is the Merilith. Her style is so badass and wickedly alluring. You're going to remember her forever. The Merilith is an upper echelon demon that serves as a captain or other leader type who has the influence to unite and command hordes of other demons. In appearance, she is reminiscent of the Naga from Indian mythology. She also calls to mind the Snake Woman from the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, or the Naga Woman. For reasons of political correctness, the Merilith is usually shown wearing armor or some kind of brassiere, but we all know that demons don't need manufactured armor, and beyond that, a demon is not going to get bashful about being modest and cover up her nipples. I respect that the game designers are trying to keep things PG-13, and this really is more of an issue related to our culture and not the game itself. If you stop and think about it, it does say something about our society when we are totally unfazed by violence or demonic imagery, yet we're sensitive and uncomfortable with the natural human body that we see in the mirror every day. But I won't digress, I'll just leave it by saying that the Merilith is one of the most powerfully evocative figures amongst the demons, and it largely comes from her connection to mythological imagery. Did I mention that she has six arms? Yes, and six arms means six sword attacks, along with a coiling and crushing snake tail. She has lightning fast reflexes, allowing her to use a reaction per combatant's turn, meaning a potential parry or opportunity attack on everyone's turn. Another one of my personal favorite demons here, and this is one that should strike terror into the hearts of adventurers. You know a monster is a really good one when the players say, oh shit, a Merilith, when she appears. DMs savor these moments. When you reveal a monster in game and the players have a strong reaction just upon seeing it or hearing its name. Alongside the Maurezi and Mordenkainen's tome is the Dibuk, whose artwork is actually a bit misleading as it shows a rotting corpse possessed by a Dibuk and not the Dibuk itself which really is a translucent floating blob thing with tendrils. I've placed this monster at the top of B tier because it encompasses everything we saw with the Marezi, but it takes it all to the next level. It's actually lower CR than the Marezi. However, when it possesses a corpse, it becomes that creature. Thus, its effective CR really depends upon what it's inhabiting. The Dubuque itself can fly relatively quickly and it's an incorporeal creature that phases through solid objects. It can also cast Dimension Door at will, so it's quite mobile. In addition to this mobility, it has access to the Fear and Phantasmal Force spells, and a Draining Tendril attack. So its true form has elements of Lurker, Skirmisher, and a Medium Range Control Caster. Personally, I would have a Dubuque trail a party throughout a dungeon, waiting for them to encounter a particularly powerful monster. If the characters don't notice the Dubuque and change their strategy, it will enter the corpse of said powerful monster, and after they've just exhausted themselves on this harrowing fight, the monster thing is going to rise again and undead under the possession of the demon, and it gets used like a puppet to fight once more. Or, even more horrible, 
if a character died in that battle, the Dubuk will possess him. And this is where DMs get reputations for being sadistic. But there is a distinction. A good DM is not sadistic. Rather, he knows how to roleplay a monster that is sadistic, that really wants to bring about the character's doom. I did a bit of research, and it turns out that Dubuk comes from Jewish mythology. It is indeed a malicious spirit that possesses people, and it immediately brought to mind the movies like The Exorcist and Poltergeist. I knew that the golem comes from Jewish myth, now I wonder what else does. Speaking of The Exorcist, the Dubuk can also make the possessed corpse perform horrid acts like the poor girl in that movie, such as head spinning 360 degrees, vomiting blood, and other disgusting effects that can frighten those who witness it. So this is probably one of the most flexible and unpredictable demons. A wild card amongst demon kind, which that's really saying a lot. The many ways this monster could present itself, and the nearly unlimited kinds of corpses it could inhabit, and the things it could do while inside those corpses is relatively open. Of course, it is a demon, so it will ultimately be limited by its utterly chaotic evil soul, and its nature of just wanting to terrorize people. But what a monster full of possibilities. It well deserves its place at the very, very highest end of B tier. So B tier was an impressive lot, full of solid design, great in-game interaction, and a few surprises in store for memorable adventure moments. Now we reach into some of the deepest layers of the abyss, and find three amazing creatures. The handmaidens of Lolth, the spies of the demon web pits, the lurkers amongst the drow. This is another remarkable demon tied to dark elf ecology. The demon queen Lolth created the Yakluls in her vile corner of the abyss, and that is the only place that they spawn. A Yaklul has four forms it can take, ooze, humanoid, spider, and mist. Its true form is the ooze one. It's a slimy, column-shaped thing with tendrils and a solitary eye. Its humanoid form is typically that of a female drow, which it uses to move about disguised. Its spider form is that of a giant arachnid, and its mist form is useful for passing through tiny spaces or escaping danger, but it's also highly toxic, so it can be used offensively as well. In combat, a Yaklul has a highly poisonous slam in ooze form or bite in spider form. It can also spider climb in all forms, and it can cast detect thoughts and web at will. And once per day, it can cast the potentially devastating dominate person. All in all, it has some very effective and versatile abilities. I also think this is one of the freakiest monsters in D&D. I even included it in my scariest d and Monsters video. Shudder to think that behind any alluring drow face could be a horrific demon made of pulsating slime and an unblinking eye. It's unsettling to say the least. I also greatly appreciate how the Yaklul has high role-playing and versatility attributes. It is most likely found taking part in dark plots, noble intrigues, and political espionage making it a candidate for all manner of interaction sequences. It is still going to do the bidding of its chaotic evil demon goddess, but within that scope, it has a lot of room for many different approaches and storylines. Making its comeback after solid entries in 2nd, 3.5, and 4th edition is the Mali Deus. The Baylor is more iconic, but this mega-powered demon takes the cake in my book. Mechanically, this monster is a powerhouse. It has a multi-attack that includes a weapon capable of decapitation. It has a wolf bite and a poisonous snake bite. It has a number of spells, including Dispel Magic, Lightning Bolt, Imprisonment, Polymorph, Telekinesis, and Teleport, many of which it can cast at will. And thankfully, it has Legendary Resistance and Legendary Actions. This is everything the Baylor wishes it could be. Appearance-wise, the Mali Deus is a bewildering creature that stepped straight out of some mythology-fueled nightmare. It's a 12-foot-tall, red-skinned demon with a wolf head and a viper head. 
It carries a weapon that reflects whichever demon lord is its master, such as a glaive for Baphomet, a great sword for Grast, and so forth. This tie to the demon lords runs deep, as many of them each have a dedicated Malideus that serves about as loyally as a demon possibly could. This faithfulness is enforced, as the demon lord can observe directly through the snakehead and speak through it as well. This service is even deeper, though, as one of the main duties of Amalideus is to guard its master's amulet. Every demon lord has one. They are powerful, dark artifacts that link the essence of the demon lords. And should one be slain within the abyss, the amulet allows it to reform instead of facing eternal destruction. As amazing of a guardian as Amalideus is, it also is a risk. If it finds a way to blackmail or coerce its demon lord using the amulet as leverage, things could get very tangled. My only complaint about the Malideus is that it does not have any artwork in Mordenkainen's tome. Maybe this monster was a late addition after the book's art had already been finalized, but it's a real shame that it got left out. But the Malideus has a lot to offer, and I highly, highly recommend it. Even if the characters in your campaign aren't high enough level to directly face it, merely including it in the storyline with glimpses from time to time is sure to have a powerful effect. Lurking at the black heart of this abyssal tour is the Sibriax, a putrid demon almost too grotesque to behold, and one of the scariest monsters in all of D&D. This creature is a floating mass of putrescence and disfigured faces. Slimy bile drips from its mass, bound with spiked chains, and it speaks with the most sinister intelligence. This monster is a fiend through and through. But in some ways, it seems like an undead, or maybe even a Lovecraftian aberration. Beyond its blood-curdling and stomach-churning appearance, the Sibriex has legendary actions, legendary resistance, spell casting such as Command, Hold Monster, Dispel Magic, and Feeble Mind, a contamination aura of poison and difficult terrain, squirting bile, and the ability to warp multiple creatures at a time, possibly transforming characters into demons. It even comes with a freakishly fantastic table of flesh warping effects that a DM can roll on. Sibriexes themselves are lore masters, in fact, spending centuries upon centuries collecting knowledge and secrets from across the plains. Indeed, their intelligence, wisdom, and charisma abilities are staggeringly high. Even demon lords are known to seek out Sibriexes as advisors, and oracles. Furthermore, Sibriexes are sort of abyssal mad scientists. They have the ability to create demons, even new breeds of demons, and they delight in transforming other creatures into members of their hordes. This monster is beyond ancient, as they've been lurking around the most remote corners of the abyss ever since it came into existence. They basically are the abyss sentient chunks of that disgusting landscape itself. There is no doubt in my mind. Other than the actual demon lords, the Sibriex is by far the coolest demon. It's way ahead of all the others. Here we have the entire demon's ranking. Woo! What a trip that was. This whole process of delving into the demonology of Dungeons & Dragons has really made me reflect on what I like and don't like about this kind of monster. I came to realize that it's difficult to spend a ton of in-game time with them. For example, my epic 4th edition campaign that spanned three years of weekly sessions in levels 1 to 30. It featured demons as the main adversaries, but looking back, the actual screen time of demons was kind of low. More often, the characters faced things that were related to demons, as opposed to the actual demons right in their face. There was a huge area of abyssal corruption that was spreading across the land, tainting everything with it. So sure, there were lots of demons, but typically they only came at the apex of an adventure and they didn't span much more than the actual combat encounters. Story-wise, 
and roleplay-wise, it was more likely to be something like cultists or Durak the Cursed, the mad undead elf who was a demonologist warlock. So, more often than not, demons are better when weaved together with other, more complex monsters and NPCs. Also, at this point, I've now reviewed demons, devils, and yugoloths slash miscellaneous fiends. Which group do I like the best overall? Well, I like them each in their own way. They each have something a bit different to offer. Uh, if I look at pure ranking stats, it seems that I like the miscellaneous fiends the best, then demons the second, then devils the third. But I don't know if that's really the best way to judge things. So I would say this. For me, devils are the best in terms of straight practical usage because they're the most organized and civilized. Yugoloths slash miscellaneous fiends are best when it comes to variety and having an edge in versatility. Demons are best for pure energy, intensity, and scariness. Dungeon Masters, I hope these rankings have given you both insights and ideas. And players, I wish you courage when fighting these fiends and strength of spirit to stave off the foul corruption they carry. I want to give a big thank you to all my patrons, in particular, Warser, Adam Wood, Dennis Cropper, Abdu, Vince the Fallen Demon, and Nick the Pirate King. If you'd like to support this channel and get access to cool things, check out my Patreon page. I make dungeon maps, you can download them, you can print them. I make monsters with art, lore, and stats. I also release free stuff, like monthly map and newsletter. So if you can't become a patron at the moment, no worries, still take advantage of all the open content. Links for everything are down below. This is Esper, I will see you all in another video soon. May your adventures be many.